let's talk about Joe Adonis. I'm going to jump back and forth. Adonis was a name he gave himself. I'll explain why in a minute. His actual name was Dotto. Uh, he was born in Italy in 1902. His real name was Giuseppe Antonio Dotto, not Joe Adonis. Uh, he was very important in the formation of the American culture, of the American mafia. So uh, he was born in a small town of Metteromano, Italy, near Naples. In 1915, he hops onto an ocean liner that he assumes is going to America, and he ends up in Brooklyn. He had a cousin there, a guy who was uh, a Genovese, what would become the Genovese family. The guy's a captain there, Alan Bono. So Bono, later, Adonis would appoint Bono to watch over his Greenwich Village operations in the 1940s and 50s. During all this time, Adonis was married. He fathered one son, who Joe Dotto Jr., who I think was legitimate. Dotto started support. He's a kid now. He doesn't know anything. He probably didn't speak English very well. He starts stealing and pickpocketing things. He's working the streets. And he bumps into Charlie Lucky Luciano and this other guy, Setiamo, called Big Sam Arcadi, uh, who were involved with gambling on a street level. And so he gets involved with that. He, Dotto felt enormous loyalty towards Luciano. He liked him. He liked him a great deal. And they would remain friends for decades. During the end, it, something happened. They fell out. But at the beginning of Prohibition, Luciano and Adonis, they go to these gangsters. They borrow $35,000. That was a huge amount of money in 21, 22. And they go and they buy alcohol. And they decide they're going to supply only the show business community in Broadway and Manhattan. And Dotto, later on, he assumes this role of a gentleman bootlegger. I guess Luciano did, too, to an extent. But Dotto was mesmerized by Hollywood people, actors, and he began to socialize in the theater district and that sort of thing. In early 1920s, he changes his name. He's so enamored with all this to Joe Adonis, the Greek god of love, Adonis. He allegedly received the name from one of his girlfriends, who was a Siegfried, Colley, uh, Siegfried Follies chorus girl that he was dating. There's another thing that he was reading an article, and he, there was something about Adonis the Greek god, and it was a, the, somebody drew their version of Adonis, and he thought, that's me. So obviously, this boy is extremely vain, and he takes a lot of time on his personal grooming. He was, he was so in love with him. So one time he's in front of a mirror, he's combing his black hair, and Luciano says, who do you think you are? Rudolph Valentino? And he says, for looks, that guy's a bum. During the 1920s, he became an enforcer for Frankie Yale as well. Yale was a friend of Al Capone's, and via that he met Al Capone. Uh, meanwhile, Luciano becomes an enforcer for Joe the Boss Masseria, who ran an organization loosely based on the Klan system of Naples, Southern Italy. After the 1928 assassination of Frankie Yale. I, I, my understanding is that one of the, uh, anyway, they were Chicago guys. We won't go into that. Masseria takes over Yale's operations, and he then becomes involved with this war with Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano represented the Sicilian clans. Most of those guys he represented came from the Castellamare del Golfo in Sicily. This war goes on as violent, and so the both sides start recruiting soldiers. 1930, Adonis is now with the Masseria faction. And then the war turns against Masseria. Luciano contacts, who's also with Masseria, contacts Maranzano. He says, well, why don't I switch sides? We'll work something out. Since Adonis, had, his loyalties were for Luciano. He didn't give a damn, so he went along with him. In uh, October 15, 1931, Adonis, Bugsy Siegel, Vito Genovese, Albert Anastasia. Wow, what a crew. They were all with the Masseria organization. They um, went with Messissary to Coney Island, the restaurant, and they murdered him. I found out recently that at the, the bear in mind, newspapers were huge at this time, massive, no TV, radio was popular, but newspaper was a tradition that went back, what, 100 years in the U.S., and big, big, big cities had four, five, six newspapers. The little place I came from had two, a morning edition, night edition, and so... It turns out, from what I understand, they took, he was shot. They killed him at a table playing cards, supposedly. Supposedly, who knows. Uh, but they took the ace of spades or something. I'll get a photo of him and put it in the They put it in his hand and snapped it. It made for good newspaper selling. That's interesting. 
Anyway, Masseria is dead and gone. Maranzano is the boss now. And he calls together all the Italian-American families. And he says, oh, I'm going to be the boss of bosses. And we're going to break you guys into families and blah, blah, blah. Everybody's happy. But, you know, Luciano, he's, he's not, he's uh, a little over the top with Maranzano's power grabs over everything. And then he discovers that, Luciano discovers, Marziano is going to have him killed. So Luciano strikes first, uh, September 10, 1931. A bunch of gunmen murder Maranzano in his office. I think I have some photos of that I can give you. So Maranzano's dead. Luciano more or less becomes a preeminent organized crime boss in New Jersey. But he's an American for all given purposes. He's not one of these dictatorial old world bosses. And he doesn't want to be boss of bosses. He sticks with the family operation things, but he also creates a national crime syndicate for all the Italian-American gangs across the country. And then there was a second one with non-ethnic group, non-Italians, I should say. But Luciano's concern was the Italian group, so Chicago could join that sort of thing. Non-mafia, in other words. Adonis is, of course, the loyalist, and Luciano trusts him. He puts him on the board of directors at the syndicate he's now formed. Uh, so Adonis now controls... Broadway, Midtown Manhattan in New York. He's got this criminal empire. He does alcohol, you name it. He's, he's got so much money that he buys a car dealership in New Jersey. There was a report in the newspapers that his salesman would sell the car and then they'd, they'd intimidate the people into buying protection insurance on the car or on themselves or who knows what it was, but it didn't do much. It just paid it. But, you know, we see a lot of this high pressure stuff today with cars. Uh, car salesman. So Adonis, he then moves into the cigarette manufacturing business, and he realizes that if he owns the vending machines, you know, he can make a fortune because it's cash. Bear in mind, in the 1930s into the 40s, vending machines were all the rage. They were everywhere. Yeah, they sold cigarettes. They sold food. There was a vendomatic. I think it was open until the 40s in Manhattan, where you walked in, and with two walls, really long walls, with little slots in them, and they had food, and you could get whatever sandwich, it was alphabetical, a tuna would be at the end, and so forth. You put 15 cents in there, you got yourself a beautiful sandwich. They were fresh, yeah. And so Adonis thinks, this is gold mine. So what I'll do is I'll just rob cigarette trucks, food trucks, whatever, and I'll sell this stuff in my... In my, in my vending machines. Brilliant move, really. It's an operation that went on, as far as I know, into the 70s in New England. It, it was on. They were putting stolen cigarettes in those things. Uh, I don't know if it's still such a big deal. I don't think it is. So anyway, uh, Adonis runs all this from uh, Joe's Italian Kitchen. It's a restaurant he owned in Brooklyn. A little place, inconspicuous place. And he runs this huge criminal empire out of there. Despite all of this, uh, he would take part in jewelry robberies, high-risk jewelry robberies at people's homes. Uh, it was just something he liked to do. It was a throwback to his early days on the street. So he was smart enough to put a lot of politicians, both locally and nationwide politicians, policemen, anybody he could use influence with on other gangsters. He paid them off. Um, he asked no questions. He paid their price, and he, he owned them, basically. So uh, Adonis and Buck Walter, this guy, Lipke Buck Walter, got together, and they formed Murder, Inc. My understanding is, by the way, is Al Capone, when the meeting was in Atlantic City, I'd forgotten the year, 1928, whatever, he said, look, well, we should have this group, and they'll kill people for us who are troublesome, and we'll share the cost. And it didn't go anywhere. Well, it did go someplace. They formed Murder, Inc., so Thomas C. Dewey in the 1930s, he's this for the mob, this pain in the ass, special appointments they prosecuted for in New York. He wants a piece of Luciano. He wants him bad, too. He eventually gets him on a pandering charge. In other words, pimping, basically. Sends him to prison upstate New York for 30 years. Uh, you know, I wonder today, I'm not an attorney, I, but I wonder today if he would get, Luciano could get nailed on that. It was a really weak, weak case. Even, but even Dewey said, look, my witnesses are pimps, prostitutes, murderers. And uh, Joe Valachi said, it. he said, Charlie Lucky ain't no pimp. He's a boss. So I don't know, but they got him because the U.S. wanted Luciano in jail. Uh, you'll see this time and again, if you pay attention to history, 
what the federal government wants, it usually gets. They get rid of people. John Guy is an example. He just hounded that guy until he went to jail. During all this, Frank Costello is now in charge, and Adonis couldn't be happier because he's nobody really knows who he is. He's low profile. He likes it that way. He doesn't want any problems. Long story short, in 1946, Luciano gets out of prison because he supposedly worked a deal with the U.S. government during World War II. That might be exaggerated, what he did exactly. But anyway, he they throw him out of the country. 1946, Luciano out of the country, 1946. There's a mob conference in Havana, uh, Cuba. And uh, Luciano's there and he makes his pitch. He wants to regain his influence and he wants to run his operations out of Cuba. And Adonis is loyal with him. He says, sure, we can. I can help with that. That's not a big deal. But the U.S. found out... Uh, there's a lot of people say a lot of things about I think the U.S. found out because the bosses listened to Luciano and he explained his dope running operations to them, which he shouldn't have done, and his plans for the future. And they just thought, well, thank you. And they probably got hold of the federal government, would be my guess. Um, the government put a lot of pressure on the Cuban government, which was really weak. It was a puppet state, really, for all given purposes. Uh, and Cuba deported Luciano, back to Italy, never be heard from again. In the meantime, it's now the mid-40s. The government starts to notice this guy, uh, uh, Adonis. And the way he came to their notice is, the prosecutors recruited this guy, a Kid Twist Relis. That's a good name because it's what he did. He, he strangled people. He was a murderer for Murder, Inc. And he began to testify and he named Buck Halter and a lot of other people. The information he got eventually led to Adonis, who he was, why he was, and so forth. They tried to indict Adonis. Adonis, they couldn't do it. He slipped out of it. But in 1950, the Kefauver Committee comes together and they pull Adonis. He refuses to testify. He says, I've got a right against self-incrimination. Um, he throws the Fifth Amendment around. So he escaped contempt charges, but he's now got a big black eye PR-wise. People know who he is. They know he's a gangster, he's a vicious guy. He's vaguely related to something called Murder, Inc. That doesn't help. In 1951, this is another case of they were going to get this guy come hell or high water. They got him on gambling charges, and he sentenced to two years in prison. While he's doing this in 1953, they figure out he's an illegal alien, which he was, and they deport him back to Italy. He fought it. He fought hard. He fought long. He managed to put it off till 1956, but again, the government wants you gone, you're gone. And they threw him over to Italy. He buys this massive, beautiful, luxurious villa outside Milan. He's got maids and butlers and drivers and all that. Adonis is there and Luciano's there, but as far as anyone knows, they never talk, they don't speak. It was, the speculation is that Luciano was just permanently pissed off after he got thrown out of Cuba. And he thought that one of the reasons he was having such bad luck is that Adonis allowed himself to be pushed around by the Genovese people. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, January 26, 1962, Luciano is getting a plane. He's on a tarmac, he has a heart attack, he falls dead. He was only 64 years old. Adonis goes to the funeral with this, this is very American gangster, brings a huge floral wreath that says in English, song, pal. Uh, on November 26, 1971, the Italian government launches this anti-mafioso criminal operation nationwide. They go to Adonis Villa, they grab him by the scuff of his neck, they throw him into a jeep, they bring him to a small hillside, the shack they had, they were using it for interrogations. It was a very long interrogation. The, 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 the facts are blurry. I don't think the Italian government really wanted to get this out, but Anyway, Adonis went into this thing. He didn't come out. He died. They said he died of a heart attack, but th there was no, they just, he's dead. He died of a heart attack. That's it. And very low key funeral uh, by his media family. And then they were, he was allowed, the body was uh, sent to New Jersey to the Madonna Cemetery in New Jersey. Well, I want to tell you one more thing about uh, the Kefauver, why these guys became so fair. I think a lot of people don't understand a lot of younger people, that's, that's understandable, they haven't been on the planet long, they don't know these things. TV was relatively new. Not everybody had TVs, but still, the Kefauver Committee really hit it off. It was a big, big numbers. As an example, uh, neighborhoods are mostly gone now. 
there was a time in this country when the cities, neighborhoods had bars. And they weren't like they are today. We wouldn't get drunk and low lives and that. It was a neighborhood thing. There was two rooms usually. So there was the bar. And then there was another room uh, with more formal seating. And uh, and that's where the TV was. And the people would go in there. They'd have dinner. It was a, it was an inexpensive night out. You know? So you'd go in there, you'd have your drinks, eat your meals. There were rules. In Connecticut, there were no seats at the bar because they figured if you had to sit while you're drinking, you shouldn't be here. Women weren't allowed at the bar. That was that. They had to go in the side room over there and uh, drink their beer and watch TV. Another alleged underworld leader, Joe Adonis, continues the defiance of the committee with stubborn determination and almost categorical contempt. Answer on the same grounds. Well, with any other part. I decline to answer on the same grounds. Uh, you've been free now on bail now, immigration authorities. Yes. How do you feel? Fine, fine. Uh, do you think the immigration authorities will deport you to Italy? I do not know. Thank I, you very much, Joe Adonis. 